I think we should start. Can I say uh, a good evening and a very warm welcome to everybody joining us for our drawing discussion with Chris Bruce and Isabel Rock. I'm Anita Taylor. I'm the director of the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize project. I'm also the founder and director of Drawing Projects UK and Dean of Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. And I'm convening the evening. Uh, we've been running a series of drawing discussions and events alongside the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize 2020, uh, which should be on show to the public right now in London. So we've continued with the online programme okay. and we've I launched the, the um, our virtual interactive exhibition, which you can visit on the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize website and also Trinity Boy Wolf's website itself. So I hope that you'll take some time to enjoy the exhibition as it is installed uh, in the chain store at the heritage site of Trinity Boy Wharf. And we're looking currently at uh, the chain store and the wharf um, on the photograph on the um, screen. Uh, we're looking at it from the river as you approach it by boat uh, from Greenwich. So the evening, these drawing discussions have been put together so that we're meeting a number of the artists included in the exhibition. And we're going to focus very much on the drawings that have been selected for the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize 2020. And we're really thrilled that we have Chris and Isabel with us this evening. The event is being recorded and what we would like you to do is to ask questions through the Q&A function. We'll also be monitoring the chat. I have Fiona Cassidy with me on behalf of Drawing Projects, uh, who will be making sure that we pick up your questions as we go. And the format of the evening is to invite Chris to speak about his drawing and then Isabel. And um, then we'll follow that with a question and answer session. So thank you for joining us. Um, Without further ado, we'll introduce Chris Bruce. And Chris Bruce is an artist who lives and works in Cornwall. He's based in Falmouth. And he studied at Cheltenham School of Art or Cheltenham Art College, uh, and also at Falmouth Art College after that for a postgraduate MA in Contemporary Fine Art. He's been included in a number of uh, group exhibitions and held exhibitions, including um, Cornwall Film, and painting the land in Cambridge. I'm really delighted to welcome you, Chris, and to hear about your beautiful drawing. So welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, and hello everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be invited and uh, also to talk about this drawing, um, which I've never really had occasion to discuss um, at any other time. So this is a wonderful platform really to um, enlarge my own thinking about it as well as to, um, to talk to people. Um, the drawing is uh, called Island People and um, it's one of a, a series that I'm making um, at the moment, have been making for the last couple of years on a consistent basis. And before that, um, I explored the process a little and stopped and started and so on. So it has a little bit of history. Um, there's another one from the series, um, which is in the Royal West of England show also online, which if you're interested or you visit that show, you, you can find and that one's called Gathering. Um, and uh, conveniently sighted behind me is, is a third from that series. So it gives just a little, uh, a little bit of an idea of how these drawings are. Um, I view, um, this, this, these, this series of drawings as, in a sense, an obverse, um, a counterpoint to another side of my practice, which is um, producing political cartoon. Um, and that's something that I do uh, via Instagram and post um, most days, not quite daily, but most days. Um, political cartoon is something which I find uh, discharges a lot of the unease I feel, have felt over recent times about the political context, the post-Brexit context, the Trump years, and so on and so forth. 
Um, and there's something very liberating about the discipline of putting something out which seems to have some relevance to what's going on in the world, which otherwise you can't influence in, in any way. Um, and also putting something out which is, which is very, very immediate. Uh, it's sometimes the case that um, I read a news story, produce a drawing, and put it on Instagram in the space of half an hour, and that feels very good. Um, these drawings, though, are, are turning away from that process, are turning away in the sense that I'm not thinking at all about what's going on in the world. Um, and it's a bit of a relief not to have to do that. Um, they're also a counterpoint in the sense that um, whilst the cartoons are made digitally and quick, and also made to a kind of predetermined idea. Um, these drawings are the opposite in every respect to that. They're, they're handmade, they take a long time. Um, there's no sort of time scale in terms of finishing them. And sometimes I, um, I take them off the wall and leave them for a little bit and then start again and so on. So all those things happen. Um, and um, I never come to these drawings with any preformed idea of what I want the drawing to be, what the um, figures in the drawing may be, what its general compositional um, thing is going to be like. There is absolutely no preconception of the final drawing when I begin. Um, and the starting point is invariably the development of a ground which um, I create usually by rubbing. Um, so I rub wall, floor, sections of wall, sections of um, stonework perhaps that's around and about and that I've seen, um, bits and pieces of um, studio rubbish, uh, bits of um, wire, uh, grills, anything that uh, has some some intrinsic interest to it and there's perhaps been around in my peripheral vision for a while and I've got some kind of attachment to it in, in, in another way. Um, so the ground gets produced um, and I dwell with it for a long time. Um, really trying to get a sense of the the atmosphere that uh, it seems to suggest to me and the independent valency of the various marks and scuffs and stains and whatever has gone into it. Um, and the early stages of the drawing are very much about just allowing parts of the ground to be more themselves to tease out um, a mark that's already there, um, to join up marks, to develop a line that seems to be in there, to define areas, whatever seems to, to want to happen. So the kind of thought processes are very much sort of, um, I would call them a, a kind of reverie, not a dreamlike process, but um, really, I'm not very much aware of too much conscious thinking going. I just follow instincts and follow the taste to sort of have a mark look a certain way. There's also, I think, um, at the back of the mind, a sort of connection going on with um, drawings uh, of various kinds that I viewed and absorbed and have interested me and I've emerged in some way or other in my style, my practice, the kind of skills that I've uh, developed for myself. And the kind of influences are both uh, graphic. Um, so I'm, I'm, there are quite a number of newspaper cartoonists um, that I love and think of. And they are, of course, high art influences like um, Dürer, um, Renaissance drawing of all kinds and contemporary artists like Paul Noble and so on. So th th there's a whole sort of um, plethora, a kind of pantheon of, of influence that 
is kind of popping up in my mind while I'm playing around with the marks on the paper. Um, sometimes I go back to the ground and put something more to it to, um, to give more um, status to a particular part of it that seems to have a character. Um, so sometimes I, you know, uh, I said I rub over bits of wire which create kind of nice sort of very uh, wobbly line kind of shape. So uh, I might sort of build up an area like that with some further additions. So the ground um, is very much the kind of the master of this drawing for quite a long time. Um, after a while, um, I begin to see images um, and I spend quite a lot of time just looking at what's there and seeing it in different ways, just as you do with a perceptual drawing where if you look at it one way, it's an egg timer, you look at it another way, it's a couple of faces. Um, within the marks that are built up, there are lots of readings occurring. Um, and um, you may see figurative images, but they tend to quickly um, join with other images um, and lose their separate identity. So th that kind of ambivalence is present in, in the ground and I look for it. I look for it and try and, and see what's in front of me in different ways. And that guides very much my sort of next stages of allowing some of these images to declare themselves by um, building up areas of dark, putting line to it, joining up um, sections. Um, and the images start to become much more clear. And um, at a certain point, um, I start to feel that there's a composition there, which is just waiting really to be allowed to happen. Um, and I sort of take the, the drawing to a stage where um, that composition is apparent, but I hope um, there's also still the ambivalence in the drawing that allows you to see it another way, or allows you to see uh, a figure in more than one uh, aspect. Um, now, Island People is, is an interesting drawing within the series in the sense that the, um, the images are more fully and separately declared than some of the others. Um, and the drawing behind me, which you can't possibly see, is of the other kind where the images within the drawing tend to be very ambivalent. And sometimes you can look at that drawing and see a certain configuration of um, figures. Uh, and on another occasion, you see it in quite a different way. So that, that sort of ambivalence is inherent in the process and something, and is probably the point at which I sort of pull out of the drawing and leave it to be itself, where it seems to be um, set, but at the same time, it has the possibility to be uh, something a little different. Um, so the process is one of image discovery, I would say. And um, it's a very much a sort of an idea that I committed to also in painting where I'm, I'm sort of through slightly different mechanisms, um, trying to do similar things with the surface of the painting. Um, the last thing I'd, I'd just like to say about this is, is really around the question of story, which is, um, it's quite important in all my practice in the sense that these, these seem to be narrative images, even though uh, there isn't a, a predetermined narrative. Similarly, my paintings are much more about something specific, which is uh, about national myth and folklore. I've also been doing um, a lot of writing um, in recent years, short stories and a novel. Um, and the question of story seems to me uh, to be something which is very um, significant and quite frightening in the modern context, 
Um, today's the day that Donald Trump has gone, but we all know that the story of the lost election is going to be huge in the politics of America going forward. And it seems to me that story is a thing that, a bit like myth, um, nobody quite knows what the, the origin of a particular story is. It has an independent um, sort of force which can become quite mon monstrous. And I'm kind of interested in, um, I suppose these drawings in the sense that they sort of declare some of the, uh, the nature of story, the figures in them um, seem to be made from spare parts. Um, and um, rather like story, there is a kind of um, gloss which is presented to you and is quite credible. But when you uh, look at individual elements, it, they kind of fall apart, so they don't cohere. And this idea of disparate elements being forced together, glossed together to make a surface, a story, um, is something that at the, the kind of uh, theoretical level I find quite exciting and is something that feeds back into the sort of desire to go back and make another of these drawings. So I think that's, that's enough of, uh, you know, an introduction to the drawing and a discussion around it. Um, and uh, I'd like to leave it there, I think. Perfect, Chris, thank you. And I think the other thing, of course, in the bringing it together is the reference of the island. Um, yes. And, and of course, I mean, I'm aware of your other work and the political daily uh, issue of drawing that you make. Um, and actually, it's interesting that separation between the two, because this does seem to have a, a brooding set of references that actually are not not dis, not unrelated um not, not unrelated at all in content um so it's i a, think it, the, the, these things surface whether you uh yeah. want them to or not and certainly the things at the back of the mind that come into the drawing i can i can see where they've come from within my uh current set of preoccupations if you like yeah. um and in titling, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the island title. Um, if there's something that I, I, I start to become aware of as I'm finishing the drawing, I try and flag that up in the title. So, you know, island is obviously a reference to, to many things going on at the moment. Yes. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. And there's a comment that's come in around um, psychic autom automatism um, as practiced by the surrealist and Max Ernst. And it's yeah. actually just a comment which is saying that it's really exciting to see it being explored. Yeah. Um, so, in, and obviously that history of the, the way of generating images does relate to that. It does, uh, very much so. I think it is, it is a form of automatic drawing in a sense, yeah. albeit that it happens very, very slowly rather than quickly uh, as automatic drawing tended to do. Can, would you like to take one more question before we introduce this? Certainly, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there's a question for, that's also come in, which is how do you present storytelling within your art? It's kind of pushing a little bit at the idea of the story and the narrative. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, I think uh, in a sense, the, these drawings are sort of evading the issue by, by not adopting any uh, predetermined story. The paintings I do, on the other hand, are around certain themes and topics, some of them taken from folklore, for example. Um, and the, 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 the question is really how you avoid illustration whilst reconnecting with the thematic that you're interested in. Um, and the way I do it is um, parried Dolically, <laughs> maybe <laughs> if that's the right word. Um, but yeah, I, I do things on the surface which are random and where I try and rediscover image and then allow that image to take over the painting, basically. Um, so uh, you end up with something which has some relationship to the thematic that you're interested in, but has also perhaps gone off in a um, uh, a surprising direction, perhaps also more of a sub subconsciously illuminated direction than it would otherwise do. I think, I, I mean, I, I think as a drawing, it's an incredibly um, suggestive 
drawing it draws you in it's actually a slow drawing it's a slow drawing to read and and you know that reflects the making process but it holds that balance incredibly beautifully and it's a drawing that really unfolds uh, and reveals it's drawing to spend a lot of time with um, and to really explore the surface of it so it, it's a, a real joy to have in the show and of course I've been handling the drawings now for several months and um, so it is always one that that just hovers in space with a conscience and a comment it's got a, a moral or not moral but it's the wrong word for it it has a, a commentary uh, which think, becomes yeah. really apparent so it's a pleasure to, we have got some more questions but i think what we're going to do is introduce isabel maybe and then we'll come back or well, maybe maybe should we have one more question there are a couple that are very specific Okay. And then, and there is time. Um, if there's so time, Anne. yes. There's, there's plenty of time. And then we'll come back to more questions. And if people in the audience want to keep putting questions in, we will get back to all of them. But one of them's about um, do you develop the drawing on the one ground only? Because it, it's asking a question about the process, which I think is why it's worth asking. Yeah. Um, I, well, the, the, the ground is self limiting in, in the sense that uh, as, you, as you build it, it darkens and you get less space to operate to then develop the uh, to develop the drawing. So yes, but uh, as I said, I do sort of reinvest in the ground in terms of having had it in front of me for a while, I may bring something else to it or I may add to it or build on it. Um, but the, I, I didn't talk about rubbing out in the context of making the drawings. There's not that much that I do, a little bit, uh, but I try and avoid it. And in any case, the ground itself doesn't really sort of allow too much rubbing out. You can't really get rid of the marks having rubbed into the paper. So um, the, the development of the ground is a very sort of felt and careful and respectful sort of business. That's a, a lovely answer and a great um, conclusion, I think, to talk about both process meaning and making meaning out of mark making. Um, which I think is, you know, the essence of, of what you're doing. Um, I'm just now going to, I suggest that we'll keep the questions coming in and we'll pull those questions together at the end. But it's now the moment to introduce Isabel. Uh, and I'm delighted that we have Isabel Rock with us this evening. Isabel has two very large um, drawings in the exhibition. So on, in reproduction, they're harder in some ways to see. Um, and Isabel studied at the University of Brighton and followed that her printmaking course there with an MA printmaking at the Royal College of Art. And she's also been in a number of uh, group exhibitions, including the Royal Academy Summer Show, um, and has been an award winner um, of a fellowship in printmaking with the Arts Foundation. And she currently lives and works in Berkshire. So Isabel, thank you very much for joining us from your studio. It's lovely having both of you with work uh, behind you and it's great to see you in situ. It gives a good sense of the scale of the work. And if we've got your images on separate slides as well. So if you let me know if you want to move on to see the separate slides. Um, yeah, do you want to start with the, the first one? And I'll talk about that one first maybe. Yeah, um, yeah so... Um, Hello everybody, um, thanks Anita and uh, thanks Chris. Um, so this is a series of five um, and I guess what I've got in common with Chris is that my drawings are very um, intuitive process. Um, I don't really plan it out before I sit down. Um, I've just got a vague idea or a kind of idea that I want to um, start and explore. Um, so this series of drawings, um, I started it um, just after my mum had died. Um, so it came from, and I, I came, I'd come and sit in here in the studio and I'd be like, I, I, I need to do something. So I was trying to work through all these feelings of like loneliness and grief and sadness. Um, and I thought if I can just pick up my pen and start drawing, by the time I finish drawing, I think everything will be okay. Um, so it was a really, it was quite a difficult process doing this drawing and some days I come in here and I do like two lines and other days I do like a little bit more and I think, yes, that's brilliant. Um, so 
the idea of the, the, the story behind the drawing is that there's a girl, so it starts on the island and the island kind of represents this isolated place of grief and loneliness. Um, and so the first step of the journey is she has to jump out of the tower um, and her doubting selves are calling her back and saying like, no, don't do it. Uh, we'll just stay here and, you know, um, indulge in our own like um, self-pity. Uh, so she has to jump off the island and then um, you get into the first scene, which is three women and they're crouching with mirrors, um, inspecting their vulvas. Um, so, and so this is the first stage of the journey, which is uh, kind of self-examination um, and kind of taking a really good look at yourself. Um, also, many women don't, don't know what their own vulva looks like. So I thought this was uh, um, just an interesting way of doing it. Um, so, yeah, so she gets into this big journey. Uh, you've got this big foot coming down um, from, from, the, from the skies. Um, and this is the great white foot of the patriarchy, um, which has come to smash everything. Um, but I thought it was a, it's a bit of a fun way to like represent it. Um, and there's also a Japanese ghost story about um, a foot that comes through the bathhouse um, ceiling. And if you wash it, it goes away. Um, but if you don't, it just kind of stamps on everything. So um, someone pointed out it's quite Monty Python-esque, which I think is quite funny as well. Um, and then in the front of the drawing, you've got this um, shop parade of uh, kind of, they're, they're luxury shops. You've got piggy wigs and you've got the opticians, which is an eye for an eye. Um, and then there's the friendly gherkin cafe and then the frog pizza hut. So these kind of represent the, um, kind of um, the glitzy, glamorous facade of consumerism. Um, they're your luxury, can't, you can buy your luxury items like a, a wig um, to make you look gorgeous. Um, and so as the, as the series goes on, you see what's behind the, um, be behind the shops and how the things are made and, and the industrial processes which are kind of um, destroying the environment and creating this kind of apocalyptic landscape um, where humans just take these resources and uh, make them into into other things which are commodities. Um, so I think that's about it for this first drawing. Um, I kind of I wanted it to I tried to keep the color palette quite limited. I know it doesn't look like it but for me that is quite limited color palette. Um, I wanted it to look a bit like a Japanese uh, woodcut print um, and I wanted the flat color and the kind of a, a bit of like 3D, but mostly kind of 2D shape, shapes and stuff. Um, so that was the first one in the series um, and I wasn't cured of my grief. So I carried on um, to this page where um, the girl, so the, the next stage is the dinner party and they're all gathered at this long table. It's a bit of a nod to Judy Chicago because um, she's great and uh, I always loved her that that work with the dinner party. Um, so yeah, in this picture you see the the kind of the city and the smoke um, and the pollution creating this kind of um, neon um, air, yeah, atmosphere. Um, and so the women are all sitting around the table, and each plate has a vulva on it, and the vulvas are kind of shedding this green pubic hair, which is then taken away by the um, little uh, dachshunds. And they take it into the next picture, which is a, where it's processed in a factory. Um, and then you can see, I'm just describing the, the picture, but um, uh, the, they, they've got these men in a pen. Um, and I, I wasn't really sure what the men they represented, whether, they're, whether the women are keeping them for like breeding purposes or whether the men have like barricaded themselves in because they've got like, they, they've got the last piece of green space and they've got, a piano and they're having a really great time in there. Um, so, th but the, 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 then the women need to keep them on, but there's a huge discussion going on around the table um, about the future and like, because I think around the dinner table, a lot of things happen and it's, a, it's where everything's sorted out. It's kind of like a boardroom as well. Um, so, and then ab at the top, you've got women, the girl, it's all kind of the same girl going through. Um, and she's on her magic carpet doing some yoga, which is one of something I felt has, something has really helped me. Um, so yeah, so those are the first two in the series and there's three more. I'm actually 
sitting in front of the, this is the final piece in the series. Um, and it's the kind of the resolution, um, it's the fountain of eternal, eternal life. Um, not you, because there's, so there's um, a piece by, I think it's Lucas Cranach, and it's a beautiful pool scene. And at one end, the, the old people get into the pool and by the, when they come out at the other end, uh, they're transformed and they've got their youth again. Um, and it's really beautiful and just, I, don't, I, I thought it was really, um, a really like inspirational piece. So, so there's a little nod to, to him as well there. Um, yeah, that's the drawings. And it, I, I think the whole process, it, it really showed me the process of creativity and how it can, the, the solace that I found in it and just how I could turn something really, I don't know, like empty and sad in my life into, into something creative. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a big journey and I was, over the moon to get them into the Trinity Boy Wharf Prize and to get a special commendation. So, and my mum would be really proud. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah. That's great. And I think it, I, I think what's astonishing about them is actually the, they're almost like tapestries and, and they quote, I think this particular one does quote um, or whether subconsciously or not, it has a reference to tapestries and the chasing of the unicorn and the capture of the unicorn uh, in that um, enclosure. Yeah. But, but they, they, they are tapestries in the sense that they're actually using a lot of references to talk about your experience of life. And the grief element of it is that actually about piecing quite a number of things together. If, I, if I'm reading um, rightly, I mean, they're, they're really complex images and uh, you, you've given us a, a really great introduction to why they're there and what different parts of them yeah. give as a whole. Um, they're an incredibly dense set of references in, the, in a very positive, exciting way. They're very layered. Yeah. Um, I think it's also um, grief for the environment as well and, yeah. and kind of what we've done to the world is really, um, that's all there as well. So yeah, I hope, I hope people can see that in, in them. Um, I think they're incredibly fascinating images and we, they, they have so many references um, and you're incredibly well informed around the kind of different references and the narratives and the way that they're pieced together um, through both mark making. So this one is much more fluid than, than the other one in terms of it's, you feel like the, the marks are very liquid uh, and yet you've still got this amazing control of a pen everywhere um, and the, and that stretch between the finest details, uh, you know, the vulvas on the dinner table through to the little dashens and what they're carrying, and yet they feel much very grand in their conception. Yeah. Um, and obviously as a cycle um, of images, they have that relationship. So they, and I, I should have said congratulations on your special accommodation too and I think it's right that it would mean something that's, that's uh, right. I just congratulated myself anyway that's perfect <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if there are any questions coming in specifically for you before there are as because I didn't want to put my mouse across your image um and lots of real excitement I mean having these in the show everywhere everybody's been very fascinated because they invite you in uh, they've got a lot of presence and they invite you in and then you find more and more and more detail and references. Um, and, you know, there are lots of great comments about um, how they talk to dreamlike worlds, um, how they talk to um, resolution of, of emotion uh, through making. Um, and there's a question for you, which is, could you talk a bit about simple process, uh, which is, could you, do you use reference material once you've thought of an idea or are you finding the image and then finding the references, I guess? Um, so I don't know, I don't tend to do, I do, I vague, if I've got, I've usually got a structure in my head and I just get an A4 piece of paper and just scribble it out really, really simply. Um, but I, I quite, and I, I sometimes I'll like pen in, like I, I just circled in where the pen was going to go in the picture. 
um, and maybe like the dinner table just to get a vague idea of it. But I, 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 I like the looseness, I mean, of, of just working without planning it and, and mapping it all out too much. Um, Cause I don't want it to look too perfect or too tight. Um, so, so generally it's very like intuitive. Um, and I just, I don't know, one bit seems to lead to another bit and I, I don't really, I think, oh yeah, that will look great. And then, oh, well, this person should have like a hat or this person needs like a frog or a building or, um, and it all seems to lead, kind of flow into the next thing. Um, but in terms of reference material, I do, I, I do Google like, what does it like grand piano um, or um, I had to look up. Yeah, it's a, um, a fairground rides as well. Um, but I, I don't, and then I'll draw them a couple of times but I don't want it to look too exact. Um, so yeah, I think the reference material is really useful um, and I do research lots of different things to draw. Um, uh, but at some point I prefer just drawing from my mind because I think it gets that freshness and it's just very, sometimes it's awkward, but I like that if it doesn't fit properly, like the fence doesn't quite, maybe doesn't quite tie up. Um, but I think that's all you need is just your, your eye is quite forgiving and, and it keeps you looking because you're like, oh, I wonder if that's, if that's if really gonna work. Um, there's no way that that dog could actually walk on those legs, but the kind of, but I think that adds to the surrealness of the, of the drawing. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to move the slide on so that we've got an image by both of you, because there's a question for both of you. Um, and the question is to both of you, which is about unpacking. It's a thank you for unpacking the thinking and method behind the fantastic work that we're looking at um, and the question is how do you consider the discourse of otherness in your respective works I don't know who'd like to go first maybe Chris um, I think that I don't really sort of dis I don't really start with um, those sort of considerations I think that's that's probably the it's, it's a bit of a cop out from the question, but in a sense, that sort of discourse um, and the way it plays out with, I don't know, you know, sort of political policies about migrants and all that sort of stuff is sort of material that I might well um, create a cartoon around. Um, and so it's sort of in there and um, if those thoughts then emerge in some way into then the drawing process, then um, that's going to happen. And I think that um, certainly if that, if that was a sort of a major and very traumatic moment that was going on, I've no doubt that, you know, that discourse would emerge in some fashion or other. Um, but I wouldn't, in these drawings, want to politicise the image. I feel that isn't really what they're about. Thank you. And Isabel? Um, what, exactly do, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, we, we will try and unpack what we mean by that without, unless the person would like to type, type it in quickly into the chat. Um, the, I think the question is about, about the otherness. I mean, they create otherworldliness. They create otherness in terms of different references. I think there are lots of different cultural references, perhaps in your drawings as well, which talks to a collective experience, yeah. which I think is very um, beautiful, actually. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, we're, I'm reading a question. So the otherness is a, the sense of, I think, being in another world, right. or a sense of suspended reality, a sense of a new different kind of reality um, that you're presenting. Yeah, I'm, I'm that, I mean, I am, I am to create a different a world or a f reflection of our world, but also while trying to make it accessible to everybody. Um, 
so the you can't really see it but the ladies are in this um are actually green mm. um so i mean partly because she's kind of sick with grief but partly because i didn't want to draw her pink or white or brown but i thought green was quite a, a, an accessible color maybe um and i also find it easier to use things like gherkins or um or pigs to to kind of represent maybe something which is a bit more open to interpretation and not kind of putting putting a I don't know a, a gender or a race or um, sexuality or whatever onto it. So I do I do think about otherness a lot, and I think especially when you're drawing narratives, you do have to be quite thoughtful about about how people read them. Um, so it is yeah it is very uh, very important to me. Um, to make it kind of um, interesting and, and, and thought provoking, yet non offensive, um, and hopefully humorous as well. So, yeah. I think you're hearing that humor actually is important uh, in terms of you're dealing with quite serious topics, but using humor yeah. um, to access that. Someone who saw the work in uh, the Cooper Gallery, um, and this relates. Uh, it's from Deera Chakraborty. It's, I love the multiverse you create, and I think that's a lovely way of talking about the, the way these images um, come together and their references uh, through that. But she also has a question about your choice of materials, um, and it might be interesting, I think, to hear about the choice of materials for these. Um, so these are all in acrylic ink. Um, which I really, I really like. I, I like the vibrancy of it. Um, and I normally draw with a dipping pen or um, I have a paintbrush, which is made from squirrels hairs, um, which I got, got in India. And you can get a really fine line. It, it's a more flowing line and you can get a thick and thin line with it, which I really like. Um, so yeah, I prefer acrylic ink to watercolor um, and these, Usually I do a lot of collage work as well with woodcuts, um, but these are, are completely acrylic ink. Um, I just, I really like quality of line. And I think, I guess that comes from Japanese prints and Japanese woodcuts, which I'm a big, big fan of. Um, so um, yeah, just that crisp line is really important to me. Um, and the, de the amount of detail that you can get a dipping pen or a pencil or a pen is, is really, Great. <laughs> That's great. And, and there's a question also um, about whether it's channeling the intuitive. Um, I mean, I, I guess I think that's what you've already described as a, as a channeling of uh, intuitive references yeah. as well as yeah. experiences. I think it's about, it's how I feel about the world at that time. And I am, I'm trying to create a world where anything can happen, but obviously it's got this world reflected in it. Um, and, and and yeah, I guess if I was just to draw, like Chris said about illustration, if you were just to draw a plain illustration of like the world today, it wouldn't, it would be different. But I'm trying to make something which people, I don't know, feel excited about and it kind of fires their imagination. They think, oh, what if, like, wouldn't it be great if a big book came down and smashed all this rubbish? Um, or, or wouldn't, it, you know, oh, isn't it terrible how this book is all the we've destroyed all the trees or, um, so yeah. So I think, yeah, that there, there is that. I, I, I guess my work is very illustrative, but in a, I don't know, um, experimental kind of surreal way. There is a question in, in the questions around the difference between illustration and drawing. Um, I don't know if either of you want to respond to that. Yeah, it, it sort of lurks around <clears throat> figurative imagery, always, I think. Um, I don't really mind um, if someone said my, my work is illustrative, because um, I think, you know, illustration is, is um, a wonderful and legitimate field. It's just a question for me of um, how you begin and set about it. So an illustration would begin with um, a preformed intention 
Um, and as we've both been saying, um, this work doesn't really uh, need or require or work with preformed intention. So um, what emerges is what emerges from within the process from outside. So you could, you could allow that as a distinction if you wished, um, but rather like the debate last night about what's a painting and what's a drawing, um, you know, it's, it's fun to toss around because it gives you a way, a, a position from which to look at work and to view it in one way or another. Um, but I don't think it's particularly pivotal kind of question to resolve. It's a good definition as to where the difference sits as well, I think, within these. I don't know if you wanted to come in on that, Isabel. I mean, I think, yeah, I think Chris has said it pretty, yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't mind if people say they're illustrations. I mean, um, I write little stories too, and I illustrate them. And sometimes I look at my drawings and I write a story. So it's it's really like, you can't separate it for me. It's, and it's it's good, yeah. Great. There's also a I mean, question I, about... I, I did mention I've been I've been doing quite a lot of writing in in recent times, um, and I've discovered that one of the joys and bonuses of having laboured and written something is then you can you can illustrate it. So I do that, <laughs> which is brilliant. And I think the 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 sense of the narrative, the creative writing, creative practice um, relationship, I think is really apparent. And I think it's the question of when it when does it need words? It doesn't in this instance. Um, there is a question from um, Lorum, um, which is about write, the writing of stories and a reference, which I'm not sure I'll pronounce correctly. It's a Spanish reference of Rayola uh, by Julio Cortazar. Um, and uh, she's really suggesting that the opening narrative of the drawings reminds of the structure of the book. So I think we may share that with you because um, then you'll have the reference. But it was a question really about, I guess, are you reading other fiction, other creative writing that maybe reflects a parallel process of making as well as writing I, yourself. At the time I made that drawing, I just read um, a novella called The Invention of Morel, um, which is based in an island and it has, um, it's, it's a peopled island, but it turns out that the people are actual um, projections through Morel's invention rather than real people, real living people. So there's a sense of perhaps an island and it's peopled by uh, beings other than ourselves, um, even though we may feel um, certain affinities with them. Um, but very, again, a very, very tangential influence in my case on you know, the outcome of that particular drawing. But, but very pertinent at the same time. I mean, really yeah. interesting, yeah. the parallel. The island, the island idea was kind of flying around. Yeah, around. sorry, yeah. the controls are doing something slightly odd. <laughs> um, but and again, with you, Isabel, is literature a, a big influence or um, or less so? It doesn't need yeah, to be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, I'm I'm hungry for literature all the time. Um, yeah, I read I read loads. Um, I think I think it's difficult to say how directly it influences my drawings, but I think definitely um storytelling narratives um kind of the way humans interact together is really important to me and the social structures that we have um is also really like fascinating and i think i i really um yeah reading is, is really important to me yeah thank you and then another question which is for both of you i mean you both work in series um, and I guess the, the question is, do you work on more than one piece at a time? Is that a fluid relationship between the series of work? And it might be interesting to hear from both of you about that element of the making process. Um, in, my, in my case, obviously the, there are other series going on in the background in addition to the drawing. So in a sense, that, that, that's part of it. Um, when I'm when I'm happy with what's happening on a drawing, I just like to see it through, to be honest, mm -hmm. even if uh, there are gaps and, you know, I spend quite a lot of time, as I said, just looking at the surface and inquiring into it, but I'm still working on that drawing. Sometimes I reach a kind of bit of a dead end and put it aside, start something else, but that that's not ideal. And um, Isabel? Yeah, I uh, work on just one drawing. I, I, I work on one I do like to finish it, but as soon as I've 
when I'm halfway through or I'm finished, generally there's the next one kind of presents itself. Um, and I guess you can't, I can't really predict, like I never, I never plan it out. I didn't know with this one. I thought maybe I'd do three drawings, but it turned into five. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a like pre planned thing. Um, but yeah, gen and generally, yeah, th this more ideas kind of pop up. And at some point you'll suddenly think, oh, I'm now I'm done with this now. I want to do something different. So, yeah. Which is fine. I mean, the thing that's very different about the work that both of you, between the works that we're looking at, um, is one's a very malleable material that you can tease out and it's very flexible and adaptable. But your ink, Isabel, is fixed. I mean, it's fixed from the moment it touches the paper. And yeah. that, that's a very extraordinary um, undertaking on the scale, um, both to be finding the image and also that you work vertically as well. I was kind of half expected that you might not oh, I do, I work do vertically. Actually, I actually put it flat on the desk and then I put it on the wall to have a look at Great. it. When yeah. you're using a dipping pen, it, it, you, the flow of the ink won't, it's really yeah. difficult to draw. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? The question was really about the, the commitment to mark making. I mean, I oh, don't... Yeah, yeah. So what I've learned as well, because I put them flat on the desk, I've learned you don't put your cup of tea next to you. <laughs> um, the, the biggest problem is putting my hand in the wet ink that I've just drawn. That is a big problem. And also getting blobs of ink on it. Um, I think I'm quite neat, but there are accidents do happen. Um, and in the previous picture, in the other, the second picture with the dinner party, one of the ladies has actually got a big blob of yellow over her crotch and that was an accident. Uh, but I couldn't, but once it was done, it was done and I look a bit like urine and I, I, I was like, I'm just going to have to leave that. Um, so, and it, you can scratch away stuff, but little, little smudges, you can scratch them away with a scalpel, but this was too big. And there isn't any other yellow on the picture, so I don't know how that happened, but... Um, I, I tend to just leave it and I think, well, that's part part of it, really. And, and that's all fine. I mean, the thing that we probably haven't really pressed yet, I mean, the, the, quite a lot of the image is very much about the body, isn't it? And um, there's a sexuality that runs through them. Um, and I guess that, you know, we're teasing out um, something which about flesh, about um, the kind of a slightly animal nature of uh, human relationships. Yeah. I think I don't I don't really like drawing clothes because well I, I like I like clothes but as soon as you put clothes and there's um a, the there's certain messages which are about who they are um where they come from um kind of what class or like what their aspirations are or there's so many kind of other mm -hmm. elements which are brought in messages which are brought in with what we wear so I just I like drawing naked people um and it's just kind of, I guess it's more timeless maybe, and maybe kind of, ex maybe accessible to everybody. Um, but I, I maybe one, so I tend to go through stages and at one point I only drew men and then I drew kind of genderless goblins for a long time. And now I just like drawing women. So who knows, maybe in the future I'll start putting clothes on people. Um, Cause I think also with the narrative, as soon as you put a hat on someone, it says something or if you give them shoes, like what type of shoes do you give them? And what does that mean? So there are, there's a lot of, um, like someone like Grayson Perry is really good with like the messages of like what people wear and what this like signifies. Um, so maybe one day, one day I'll put clothes on them. <laughs> <laughs> Wait and see what happens. It depends on the subject, doesn't it? How much yeah. The content yeah. and the response. And um, for both of you, um, I guess there's a question about how you want the world to see the works. I mean, do you want to present them in a particular environment? Should we be seeing them in series um, rather than the one beautiful or two beautiful specimens that we have in, um, or examples in the drawing prize? I mean, they're, they're, they're drawings that really hold their own, um, but I guess it's a question about maybe what plans you would have or ideal context in which to show them um, to both of you. Sure. I, um, I mean, I'd love to show um, the series as, as such, um, uh, because there's a kind of evolution in, in the, um, the feel of the drawings that goes through it. And um, I think the whole um, experience of seeing a group of work that's kind of 
come out of the same moment is an enhanced experience anyway. Um, but you're right, I mean, I think each individual drawing is, is happily independent and, and that's fine. And, uh, I, you know, my aspiration really is, is that um, these drawings are above all um, a celebration of a graphic voice and what's, what's in that and the history that goes towards the forming of, you know, the particular drawings. Uh, and that's, that's fine by me. I think that, you know, more reading than that is, you know, um, is what other people bring to it, perhaps. That's great. Thank you. Isabel? Um, my ego would like to show them all together in a room at the Royal <laughs> Academy. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, anyway, and I would I would love to show them all five of them together, where, where people yeah. can just get up close and like put their nose like a centimeter from the glass and just inspect it. Um, I always think places like cafes are really not a nice place to, place to show work, um, just for kind of turnover and, and something to look at in a cafe. So, um, but anywhere, I mean, art galleries are great as well. Anywhere, anywhere that wants them, just give me a call. I'm not. <laughs> Uh, I think, I mean, I think what they would look spectacular all together in one space. I mean, I do yeah. think, you know, they hold their own uh, as they've done on tour in the exhibition. And I'm delighted that at the chain store we could actually put them side by side. Yeah. Um, partly the way that, um, you know, the spaces dictate a little bit how things can be installed. But what I'd really, really like to say is the most enormous thank you to both of you for presenting so much about your work and to sharing that with a huge generosity and insight and um, really responding to those questions too. So can I say one enormous thank you on behalf of everybody here um, in the audience, uh, particularly from Drawing Projects UK and the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize team. Um, it's a real privilege to have your drawings in the show. It's a real privilege to meet you and to hear you uh, speak about them. And the one thing that I'm really loving about all of these drawing discussions is that in the audience, it's doing what we do in the show, is that there are a number of the artists who are your fellow exhibitors in the exhibition of the 56 who are following and having this dialogue and discourse around the exhibition this year. So thank you for participating in this. It's a real pleasure. Um, real pleasure to have the drawings in the show. They've had a great response. It's been a pleasure to be here, definitely. Thank you. Um, yeah, 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 thank you so much for all your organising and uh, hard work. It's been, um, it's been a real brilliant. The, the joy is to, to see great drawings, um, lots of them, and to meet great people making drawing and talking about drawing. So can I say one enormous thank you and to say good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining us. And just to say, we have uh, another drawing discussion tomorrow evening uh, with Mark Clay and Peter Sutton. And then on Friday as the last stage of this particular series of drawing discussions alongside the exhibition, we have the Teaching Drawing Symposium and the What's Next Drawing Correspondence um, session. We will then take a small break uh, and we will start to roll out a few more events uh, as we go, we're very much hoping the exhibition will continue on its tour uh, to the Gallery of Arts University Bournemouth and we'll keep you posted. But in the meantime, please engage with all of the online um, events, enjoy the, the, the virtual interactive exhibition and all of the footage uh, from the recordings will gradually find its way to the Drawing Projects UK YouTube channel so you can reflect on a number of the discussions and meet a number of the artists. Thank you very much, everyone, and 